like that hello Renzo imagine seeing you here um I know tell, every, I tell I, everybody I what you've got a link and I found myself here uh, yeah so what are you talking about this week Enzo well uh as most of the uh, fans of the show uh understand I was not here for most of the show uh last week because uh, my friends from Border Town Paranormal, which uh, I know there's, I see Jessica Holman in the chat. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone else out there from the team in there. Uh, we all journeyed up to Geneseo, Kansas, which is a small town in the middle, kind of in the middle of nowhere in central Kansas, uh, because that is where the kind of self designated UFO Museum for Kansas is. It's kind of the, the central nexus point nobody else was doing they're like we'll do it so uh mostly because uh back in the 50s and 60s uh the town doctor of this uh small little place was really big into ufos but ufos were a big big thing in the 50s already uh and he was extremely interested in it uh so much so he was doing his own research he would travel to uh, different areas uh, of the central part of the U S to, you know, interview people and take pictures and samples and you know, the whole works, all the same stuff that an investigator today would do minus the internet, mm. minus phones, maybe even minus electricity in some cases for some of the places he had to go because that stuff wasn't that widespread in the early fifties, especially. So uh, did a lot of legwork for all of this. And uh, when he uh, eventually, you know, he, he was always proud of his little town of Geneseo, Kansas, that he uh, worked and lived in. Uh, so much so that uh, when he passed away, they decided to take the house. It was actually his parents' house. His parents, uh, uh, he, he had this house built and paid for by, or, you know, for his parents because he was a doctor. He had a lot of money. Uh, back in those days, and his parents lived there. They passed away. I think he moved in at some point much later, but then he passed away. And basically, they dedicated his house to be the town museum. And uh, the, you know, the it's basically it's got this um, most of the it's because that's what it is. It's not really a UFO museum exactly. It has UFO stuff in it, but it's the Geneseo Geneseo Town Museum where they've got like some of the first newspapers from the area from you know the late 1800s uh the all they have a all of the graduating classes from the little tiny schools you know the yeah 1902 graduating class there's like two people in it uh you know that kind of thing uh but it's quaint and amazing they have this whole uh uh flipboard kind of thing with all of the the graduating classes from you know the early 1900s up to today. And it's just, I, I was fascinated by it. We're just flipping through, just looking at the people, how they were dressed, you know, what the, you know, was a regular kind of appearance, kind of a thing for them, uh, their daily life stuff. And it, was, and it was amazing. A lot of amazing stuff, uh, small town USA, kind of a, a historical retrospective, just walking through the whole house. But there's one room in the center of the ground floor that is, uh, for the most part, uh, <laughs> award-winning spam. Uh, that's true. Uh, they uh, were, they were. What was the magazine where uh, it was like that? They, I, I don't even remember now. There's, there's so many little 
tchotchkes and little like news clippings all over the entire house. Uh, that was that was one of the things that uh, Jess spotted. That uh, but there's the one central room in the middle of the house that's all about his uh, UFO research. Uh, some of the stuff there's sur- there's a there's some amazing illustrations that uh, some of the people that helped him with his uh, work did. And uh, I will point out uh, uh, Mark, one of the guys from Border Town Paranormal, uh, as he was kind of doing his walkthrough, did a full video walkthrough of pretty much the whole place. And uh, the raw footage of that is all available on their YouTube page, which just put the link in there. Please go by and uh, possibly you know, subscribe if you like what you see. But uh, he has several different videos of just the raw footage of walking through. Uh, the guy that runs the the whole thing, Jim, uh, which uh, you, we'll see the pictures of in a minute. <laughs> it, it, that's that's what he looks like all the time. That's what he always wears. <laughs> I'll see what. <what's> <laughs> but uh, that this is uh, you can buy t-shirts and mugs and uh, amongst other things, uh, tchotchkes there. Your time at the uh-huh. Geneseo City Museum. But uh, these are just some random. This is the house. You can what this is Geneseo Museum here. You walk in, you, you you walk through the whole tour. They have an attic area full of stuff. It's it's pretty interesting stuff if you're interested in that small town early, you know. It's you so know, cute too. Early it's America, cute- yeah. But uh I have a bunch of pictures from the uh the UFO section where it's mostly a lot of uh newspaper clippings and photographs. Actually, uh, Enzo. See that picture you're looking at there? Um, the bottle of water. I did see him ba- uh, roughly talking about that in the raw footage. What? That water's how old? It was ancient. It's a bottle of almost ancient water. Um, but I, I forget the, the exact. It's it, it's certainly in the videos. Uh, I yeah, forget it is the in the exact. video how old it was. I, like it's something it is, 60, maybe more I, years old, the water in the yes. bottle. I'm like, ew, uh, you wouldn't want to get it thirsty was, and drink it. <laughs> It was it was a water sample that they took at uh, a site. I, I don't recall the exact stuff. Uh, what the situation was with that particular one, but uh, there is a specific thing that you brought up uh, from the videos that I will take a closer. We will take a closer look at here in a minute. Oh, the dog. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the dog. Actually, that's the dog right there. Uh, yeah. James Hill, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, uh, John Dean helped them out. Uh, they did. They have a lot of old photographs it's like the world's going on in this photo a lot of uh, older books that were in there we'll, th- we'll take a closer look at this uh, book here in a second buck nelson who's uh it, it's hard to just it, it's it's a uh it's a contact story it's not an abduction he, he, it was nothing against his will but uh from like 1955 it's, it has a heavy influence we're uh about that and if you're interested in the Buck Nelson story, I have a video, but uh, you can just do a search on uh, YouTube to find out a little bit more about Buck Nelson. But Buck Nelson's story is very similar to a lot of other stories from the 50s when it comes to UFOs, where they see a UFO, they kind of like shine a light at it, it shines a light back. Uh, you know, it comes, it disappears and then comes back after a few days and lands and people that look just like you and I get out and uh, have English conversations with them. It's like, hey, you want to go for a ride on our spaceship? And they take them for a spin around the solar system. And often, uh, you know, these human-looking aliens say that they're from somewhere within the solar system, Mars or Venus or Jupiter or wherever, Mm -hmm. uh, around the stuff. And uh, this particular one is one of those early stories of uh, where, uh, you know, he's a simple farmer in uh, little uh, nowhere, Missouri, uh, it has a full story of uh, getting picked up by some uh, folks from Venus, which had apparently a gigantic dog that was uh, several hundred pounds with them, which uh, is a di- we'll talk about a different dog from Venus here in a minute. Mm. But uh, there's diagrams of his of the ship they were in. It was, it's it's a pretty interesting story. But uh, another uh, contactee, Chief Frank Buckshot Standing Horse. From uh, Oklahoma, and very similar uh, story of uh, contact with uh, these 
spacemen, as they often referred to him, uh, where he was taken up uh, in a in base, you know, your basic flying saucer, and they flew up to a large mothership, kind of arrow shaped, kind of uh, rocket ship style mothership up in orbit, kind of thing, and he got the whole nickel tour. Uh, Dr. Jansen was uh, the, the this doctor's name. He had you know several other friends that were astronomers and stuff like that. There's Jim, Jim Gray. Yeah. Uh, this is what Jim looks like all the time. Uh, this is his normal dress. This is what he always wears. Uh, and it's it's not a costume thing. It's not a okay. I'm going to the museum. I gotta you know yuck it up. No, that's just how he normally dresses. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's him uh, giving the discussion, which if you watch the videos over the other thing, you'll, you'll, you'll get to hear Jim explaining a lot of these uh, things. I like this one. We actually pulled the, this one out of the case. Flying Saucers Close Up by John Dean. Uh, spacemen urged the author to compile this book, supplied much of the information, and approved of this work. Wow. Scoop. <laughs> there you go. And uh, you can apparently get a robot armor on and fly around in this hover scooter thing. I guess. <laughs> but uh, they have a lot of other memorabilia. These are uh, a bunch of old license plates that used to be on cars uh, in, throughout Kansas. Uh, I think the earliest one is, yeah, there's a 1925 license plate there. I don't know what year it was, but they were very proud that Miss America from, was from Kansas one year. So Kansas, home of Miss America, land of beautiful girls. I don't know <laughs> why you would hang that on your truck, but apparently that was a thing. Oh, uh, They've awesome. got parts of the town itself. You know, this is, again, the history. This was, uh, I forget what the, it was. It had this really wacky name. This was like the contabulator or something that they had at their local bank which that thing weighs about 80 pounds. And that's how they did all of the deposits and withdrawals and all that. And you can see it's got a million different keys for different things that it had to do. And there uh, it's, it's, it's crazy time with uh, the old tech there. All right, here we go. This is what Karen, I think would be most interested in. Oh, yo, uh, look at the little nice dog. <laughs> we got, we got, we got a little dog. We're going to zoom in and read the byline here. On October 15th, 1950, a spaceship from the planet Venus landed on the open space back of James L. Hill's home near Seymour, Missouri. The spacemen let their dog, Queen, out of the ship, and she gave birth to six pups under a tree. Five were brown-like in color, and one pup was snow white. The spacemen told Hill that they would not take a mother queen back on board the spaceship after so soon giving birth and for Mr. Hill to take good care of queen and that she would be mostly friendly in a few days. And uh, she was just that. Hill brought queen and her pups to his house. The spacemen told Hill to give queen and five of her pups away and for him to keep the solid white pup for his own. And they told him to call her Queenie. Queenie eventually weighed about 80 pounds as an adult. She was very intelligent, understood telepathy, uh, loved to watch TV programs of a Western type, and Lassie programs. Imagine mm -hmm. that. When Lassie was in trouble, Queenie was almost tearful. Here groomed Queenie quite often and saved her silk-like wool. And now, 1965, when this was written, uh, has about seven pounds of it. Queenie died February 11th, 1961. The graves of Queenie and her mother, Queen, are carefully kept today in Hill's backyard. Aww. And this is a picture of Queenie. From the planet and Venus. This wow. is a lock of Queenie's hair in the display case. <laughs> Isn't it such a cute little story? What if it was true? Well, I mean, uh, I suppose I suppose aliens could have dogs. I mean, what's stopping them? 
Yeah. Uh, well, Buck Nelson's story, he goes into great detail because uh, Buck Nelson, they took him to Mars. They took, well, it was, he, he put on his best bibbed overalls and his dog and they went and boarded the ship and they took him for a ride. He went to the moon and met with the leader of the moon and went to Mars and met with the leader of Mars, went to Venus, met with the leaders yeah. of Venus uh, there was a there was a common theme of hey you Earth people and your nuclear weapons you better watch it that's going to be a mess for you guys. The, and, this uh, place is awesome. Like even look there up the top the photograph an actual photograph of the spaceship taken June what is it June sixteenth nineteen sixty five like yep New this, Mexico this, this like was, it. yeah this is Albuquerque uh, this uh, this picture of a spaceship flying saucer in quotes, uh, was taken in Missouri prior to 1960. This particular dog right here, Big Bo, a dog from the planet Venus. This dog was on the spaceship in which Buck Nelson took his trip to Mars, the moon, and Venus. April 1955. The dog weighed 385 pounds. That's pretty big, isn't it? <laughs> That's Just very that long. <laughs> that can't be right. That'd be a monster. I'd be bigger than a wolf. I don't even think a wolf would make. <laughs> oh, Maisie's asking you a question, Enzo. Did anyone ever test the dog? I do not know. Uh, I I would assume someone would have, but uh, I didn't. Uh, I was actually talking with someone else when uh, I think Mark took this particular picture. Uh, this is actually Buck Nelson's dog that went with him on the trip to all the planets. So he had his own dog. Uh, went with him, his own Earth dog. But uh, <laughs> Buck Nelson wrote a, a whole book about it, My Trip to Mars, the Moon, and Venus. Uh, he actually was one of the first people to start up like UFO conventions in the 50s where uh, people would come from all over the world to interview him and talk to him and have a lot of interesting stuff. And very much like today, uh, after about uh, 10 years, you know, when it started getting into the early 60s, uh, mm -hmm. He decided he wanted to upgrade his uh, almost sort of semi-celebrity status uh, and start asking for money because he wanted to build a giant radio tower to transmit his message. Because that's the other thing is uh, all the different aliens he met here in Solstice kind of had a basic message of, look, there's 12 rules that you have to live by that if you do that, your, your society is going to be great. We don't have you know, none of these other plans. We don't have wars. We Basically, it was very similar to like the Ten Commandments plus two. They had two yeah. other ones, so it, there there's certainly similarities. Uh, but uh, uh, so he decided uh, he would uh, you know, and again, remember late fifties, early sixties. He's like, I need fifty thousand dollars to build this giant radio tower that to spread his word a little about that message of you know, the, the twelve rules. And uh, maybe even strong enough to maybe contact these other planets directly. And the current state of uh, you know, 50s, 60s ufology, very much like today, was like, we're not giving you a bunch of money. You're a grifter. You know, kind of attitude. So uh, he kind of fell out of favor for a little while. It's, uh, and then the um, Buck, Buck Nelson, is that him there in that photo? Because who's that? I uh, don't think. No, that, that's actually, I, I don't, this is this is the one thing about the museum is sometimes there's like random photos kind of thrown in that don't really match the rest. That's actually a uh, side, famous side profile picture of Valiant Thor, which is a whole other story, uh, who uh, came to Earth from one of our planets here, the solar system, and was speaking to Kong. And there's actually pictures of them. And that's one of them. Yeah, I've just googled him. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know that's but for the '50s and basically like what happened with Buck Nelson uh, is uh, once the space race started kicking in in the mid '60s and stuff like that, people started you know we're sending you know, probes out to all of these planets that these uh, very human-like aliens uh, say they're from. People are like, hey, you said you went to the moon and there were like towns and cities and dogs and all that stuff. It, it's empty. It's rocks. <laughs> What's going on? So, <laughs> well, and, and again, that this was the 50, this was before we ever went to the moon. This is uh, actually even sometimes even before like the first satellite was launched in. 
uh, to orbit by the Russian, you know, Sputnik. So that was the state of UFOlogy in the 50s and 60s. Uh, now, there are some pretty interesting stuff in there. There's certainly some tales, but that was very common for that era to have very human-looking uh, aliens back in the day. Hmm. Oh, there was, a, there was a rainbow that we saw on the way home. We, we managed to skirt a whole line of thunderstorms on the way home, and uh, the gang got a picture of that. But just some random pictures from around the house. Uh, uh, here's, here's Jim. Uh, he likes uh, this one. Uh, flying saucers are real. The Air Force doesn't exist. <laughs> Which, uh, of course, you'll have directly under the map of the planet Corindor. Where did they get that from? <laughs> uh, all, all of, because uh, you'll see there, the walls are covered in amazing illustrations, which uh, one of the gentlemen that I showed a, a picture of earlier drew all this stuff. These are all from people that had encounters with aliens that told them about it or showed them pictures of their home world or, or all this. Not all of them were from like moon and Mars and Jupiter and stuff like that. Uh, some of them like in this instance is, are from some other place outside of our solar system. So is it believable? Uh, some of, you know, nowadays it's kind of like, uh, I don't think they were from, you know, Mars or the moon or, or, or mm. Venus, but, uh, and, and it's, and, and there's a lot of, uh, Photograph or uh, excuse me, uh, newspaper clippings everywhere. There's there's big fat me uh, looming over everyone else, and uh, while well, Jim's telling us a tall tale, but uh, you can see up in the corners here, we've got like this is what the clock on Venus looks like, where it's got like 27 hours or something like that. Oh. Today. And uh, you know, there's here's a spaceship that uh, you know took them there, and this is what the inside of a spaceship from spaceship from Saturn, and it's got this very schematic like diagram of, you know here's the dinner table and there's where the bathroom is and things like that it's oh, it's very it's interesting and detailed you could travel around america in that <laughs> yeah really quick <laughs> oh gosh but a lot of amazing stuff in there uh oh this is we'll, we'll get back to that here in a second uh, and again, you know, more pictures uh, a lot, there's the constant theme of uh no nukes no nuclear mm -hmm. war, nuclear war bad, don't do that, you silly humans. Uh, let's see, I, I won't get too deep into some of these other things, but then we get to two yeah, years ago. One. Yeah, explain that one. Two years ago, the city of Geneseo was, uh, had set money aside to redo all of their roads, like do had an infrastructure project for the town to you know, repave, resurface all the roads. And they want, before they like dedicate anything, it was like, okay, we need a complete breakdown of what's, what really needs work or what's something that we can put off for later. Cause we have a limited amount of money. And uh, so they had a project to go around and just do a basic cleanup of the whole town. Cause parts of the town had, you know, like we can see here at the very bottom, uh, they had cement curbs uh, along some of the streets and some of them were, were pretty old. Some of them were falling apart. Some of them were still in pretty good shape from all the way back into the 40s and uh, 40s, 50s, 60s. It was all various different stages of, uh, you know, degradation amongst the town's uh, roads. So they wanted, okay. We'll take a power washer. We'll go through the whole town. We'll take a good close look at, you know, this one stay, this one's good enough for now. This has got to go. We need to replace it. While they were doing this, this is uh, directly in front of, you can sort of see the back corner of uh, the Doc's house, the house. Uh, back there, mm -hmm. the museum back there. They came across, this is, so this is pretty much right in front of his house. Mm -hmm. They came across this etched into oh, the concrete uh, while the, while the cement was still wet. Someone basically drew, this is what's referred to as a compass rose. Mm -hmm. So you've got your, uh, find it here. You've got your, your north, your south, west, east, northeast, southeast, southwest, northeast. You know, you got your, your, your main compass points. And, uh, it kind of looks like in that southwest corner, like it might kind of be sort of like a UFO. 
kind of like the one you saw. That's the shape Maybe. you saw. That's, that's a, yeah, like a train. Mm -hmm. Now, as it turns out, and I tested this two, when I went up there to visit two years ago, when was the last time I was up there, I uh, put my cell phone, I turned on my like GPS program. So it had the exact GPS coordinates and I sat it right next to that. I had a friend take a picture of it. And when I got home, I entered those exact coordinates in there because to test their claim. If you follow a Southwest line, because that's the Southwest arm of that, it doesn't intersect any towns or cities directly. It skirts near some, but it does end up hitting right in the center of one town, right in the middle of downtown, about 500 miles away, a little place called Roswell. Roswell. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so they, that's what they, nobody knew this was there. Uh, this is in Geneseo, Kansas. Uh, where the uh, right in front of where the little UFO museum is, and uh, so they you know, they're like, okay, we're, this is the Roswell Compass. I, I got the mug to prove it. <laughs> so uh, they don't know when it was put in. They don't know when that section of uh, concrete was poured. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It could have easily been from the era in which, uh, you know, Doc Jansen was doing his investigations and things, you know, like that. Uh, it's sort of a mystery exactly what this means and uh, what exactly uh, it's supposed to come to, you know, exactly. Is that, is that, is, is it a coincidence that it happens to be pointing to the Southwest and kind of a, might be a UFO shape uh, there on that Southwest corner? Uh, that uh, and it just happens to be that when you draw a line from that exact spot, GPS coordinate, uh, it goes straight to Roswell and doesn't touch any other town until it gets there. That's a little weird. So, so obviously, whoever carved it in there were privy to the wet concrete being <laughs> like someone was there when when the concrete was laid and they've done this. But that means that someone maybe has done some research into coordinates and stuff, maybe an army guy or whatever, and thought, hey, I can carve this on outside the house and show them where Roswell is and it all, you know. But it is interesting. Like, obviously, someone's carved it in. It wasn't an alien that oh, yeah. carved it in. But, but, no. yeah, but it's pretty <laughs> interesting how they, how they did that, like how they researched that and got it to, like you say, to stop right in the middle yep. of Roswell. I mean, well, Roswell most part, is a question mark, isn't Ro it? I mean, Ro Roswell, of course, happened, you know, 1947-ish. Uh, yep. And uh, didn't really become popular in the mainstream until uh, some people came out and were kind of trying to say, hey, there's something to this uh, back in like the 80s mm -hmm. uh, is when people started getting a buzz about it. And then with shows like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Unsolved Mysteries and Sightings and shows like that, uh, that would highlight it, then it just exploded. Yeah. Uh, you know, people's knowledge and and you know hearing about it so uh prior to that which again we don't know exactly how old this is uh did somebody pour this and just say yeah the guy that used to live in that house was a big ufo nut well, well we'll put this in there and it just happens to be the a direct southwest line to the front door of the place that's unusual it's pretty interesting <laughs> But I, it's some of these people that have, you know, like I flew to Mars and I've gone to, I've got, I've got a dog from Venus and whatever. I mean, there were a lot of people back in the day that unfortunately were um, medically <laughs> unstable and could have had, you know, issues. Um, but then, who knows, maybe they're telling the truth. Maybe an alien spaceship did land and had a dog on on it maybe they maybe the dog wasn't really from venus maybe the, they picked the dog up with the the ray and <laughs> sucked him up abducted him from somewhere on the other side of the world and dropped him off there but it's 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 absolutely fascinating i love these little stories and think the thing is because they're so old we we can't really and the people aren't alive anymore we can't really prove that it's not real can we like, right. Yeah, it's you know, uh, you know. It, it, it is a piece of UFO history past kind of a thing, uh, because as I, as I mentioned 
you know, the one guy's story, uh, you know, once we started, you know, sending men to the moon, that's mm. when, uh, you know, people kind of fell off from his story. It's like, wait a minute, we sent people up there and there's not what you said. You know, that kind of mm. But, uh, one last thing, uh, if you could bring up my shared thing again is, uh, oh, sorry, something I that you can you relate to. I, finished. <laughs> uh, I had one thing, uh, one last thing, as far as the museum goes, I was talking with yep. Jim and, uh, he was like, yeah, I, I got to he, he is not a tech savvy guy. Uh, Facebook is a giant, you know, thing for him. Uh, he's, he doesn't have a lot of familiarity outside of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, yeah, I wish I need to, you know, it costs money to run commercials on TV or radio and stuff like that. It's like, just use your Facebook account, you know, just promote that. Or, and uh, I told him uh, much like I, I kind of told you, it's like, you know what you should do? Make a commercial. And uh, this is what it gave up with. Hey, UFO conference enthusiasts. We've got another great event for you in 2024. Saucers and Aliens Kansas UFO Day in Invention G is being held in the UFO capital of Kansas, Geneseo, on July 6th. This is a fun festival in the middle of nowhere. There'll be a parade, decorated yards, costumes, vendors, speakers, and a showing of the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. Appropriately, an eight-foot-tall statue of Gort and a statue of Plateau will be dedicated. This will be the only museum in the U.S. with these custom-made statues. If you'd like to donate to the statue project or attend the event, visit GeneseoMuseum.com. That's G-E-N-E-S-E-O museum.com. Be sure to bring your camera when you attend the event. That's GeneseoMuseum.com. I'll be in America on that date. Hey, also but appearing uh, at the uh, Geneseo Museum UFO Day will be Wolfgang <clears throat> from Border Town Paranormal and myself, where we will be holding a live speaking engagement there, where we'll be uh, talking about the history of UFOs in Kansas, uh, a little bit about the museum itself and uh, the dock. Uh, we'll also be doing the rare, but uh, this time, this time only questions from the audience uh, where we will uh, field whatever we can from uh, people's uh, UFO type questions that will be in attendance their live. So wow. Enzo, uh, what are we looking at Enzo? Uh, well, of course, this Monday here in the States, we did have a total solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. a total and, uh, eclipse uh, of the sun. <laughs> I decided to uh, test out one of my new toys that I got uh, just a few days prior to the eclipse, uh, specifically for it. This little white object you see on the tripod here is uh, my Dwarf Labs Dwarf 2 Smart Telescope. And uh, you can see I've got the solar filters installed so I can uh, shoot some video of the sun as uh, the moon passes out. I was going to travel about like five and a half hours uh, away to be in the totality zone, but it was cloudy. Everywhere that I planned to easily travel to was all clouded out. So uh, I ended up not going to so say, I'll just stay home and uh, I'll just try it out here. I, you know, this is uh, you know, another angle. I had a uh, external battery bank just to make sure it would record for the, the three and a half hours during the whole thing. And uh, before we jump into it, uh, this is what NASA, you know, took a picture. Yeah, they, they monitor all sunspots on the uh, sun all the time. They give them a number. You can see there's just some of them are very tiny. You can almost barely see. But you will notice uh, these two groups of larger ones, which uh, are large enough that they were clearly visible during the eclipse on uh, my video that I shot. And uh, sunspots, of course, are easiest way is probably to say they're cold spots on the sun caused by uh, the, the whole surface of the sun is uh, kind of this almost like a boiling water type of feature. It's not smooth. And uh, a lot of that roiling is because of uh, magnetism, where you've got little eddies of magnetic circulation going on. And sometimes they... You know, getting those opposites attract where you've got like a North Pole and a South Pole. 
you've got these lines of force that go between the poles, like you, you know, that old, you know, science project you probably did in grade school with a, you know, a bar magnet, you put the paper over it, you put the little iron filings, you can see those lines of force on it. Same thing, except it's on the surface of the sun and they're kind of flat, you know. Now, to give you a sense of scale, that larger one in the moon, <laughs> uh, this one, this large one here in the middle, the earth could easily fit inside there's actually like a couple of these, right? Grouped together. The earth could easily fit inside one of those. That's how big that is. So, uh, so this is very large on the surface. Uh, I've been yapping for a while. Let's just jump into it. Uh, my videos that I shot with that little camera, the original version, it was kind of small and it jumped around a lot. As you can see, it starts skewing all over the screen and craziness. And I was like, all right, forget that. I'll use a little video tech to stabilize it and look at it ourselves. And you can see those, uh, you can see those sunspots on there. I don't know why, but did it free the video freeze on your end? I, I can't hear you. You're, I think you're muted. Karen? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm muting because of my noisy birds. Um, it has frozen this end. Yes, it's you. Now it's gone. Play it again. Play it again. Oh, Play it again. It's kind of weird. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> but uh, as it goes across here, you can see uh, from my location, it comes in from the lower right. And you'll notice when it gets to the fullest part, which is coming up right about here, it kind of looks like it moves sort of up. Into the and sort of miss, yeah. There's a reason for that. <laughs> and what is the reason for that, Enzo and the science it's, guy? <laughs> it's, it's a little bit, it's sort of a, a parallax. Uh, it's your point of view as you're seeing it. Like, say, for example, you're standing in front of a railroad track that runs in front of you. It goes for miles off to your right and miles off to your left. If you take a very, very narrow angle look off to the one side of seeing the, the train track disappear in the distance, it'll seem to be kind of canted off to one side. It's not heading directly at you because you're standing in front of it. But as you look at the part that's right in front of you, it's parallel to where you're at. When you look off to your left, it seems to be canted away from you, kind of an idea. It's so the, it's, just, it's just the position you're in. It's 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 the perspective angles of things that are very large going at a distance towards you and away from you. So yep. when it when it reaches that maximum point of coverage, then it, it it appears to move off at a weird angle. You may also notice from beginning to end where those sunspots are. The disk of the sun is rotating slowly clockwise as it's moving through the sky. I just have it stabilized where it's in the center of the screen where you'll see they're a little bit tilted off to the right from where they started in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. That's so cool that you got that in. So, I mean, obviously it does, didn't move that fast, did it? It would have taken a very long time. Oh, no, that's, that's, that's a three and a half hour. Yeah long process there <laughs> then i figured out a way to uh put it in the screen behind me uh here on my little like chroma key uh green screen-ish thing mm -hmm. uh, horsed around with that so then i went i did a live with uh, some friends of mine over at unidentified s4 where we covered it yep. and I had that live over my shoulder for the rest of the show uh, there was uh, another interesting thing. This video is from a Starlink satellite during the eclipse. Which you'll see in the right. There's the shadow right there. Uh, it's This is near the beginning where it was over Mexico. Wow. And thank you, Starlink, for providing me with my internet connections <laughs> hit me up elon hit me up i'll be a sponsor <laughs> yeah you're ready to go now I'm yeah, ready to so some of their more recent satellites they put up they've mounted cameras on them and things like that uh 
So, yeah, I thought that was cool. Awesome. Hi, um, so, yeah, Enzo, with the, um, um, the eclipse thing, I wasn't truthfully paying attention to what people were saying before. They were all going on about the 8th of April or the Armageddon and all, like they always do. Whenever there's an eclipse, some crazy crowd of people says, ooh, we're going to die. Um, was that kind of what it was? Like, was that, you know? Well, um, the thing is, is the eclipse is not that out of the ordinary. It usually happens two to five times every year somewhere on planet earth it just happens to be between where the sun and the earth are to cast the shadow mm -hmm. most of the planet is covered with water so it's usually out in the ocean someplace where nobody gets to really see it so when it yeah. does well, that's where the aliens live though in the ocean so that's, that's right. why we don't see it so so <laughs> but it's still you know the moon's still orbiting in the same place it always has uh so it's not like it's getting closer. It's not like it's further away. Or it's, it hasn't changed its position. There would be no different effect on the tides and all of these other things that people were saying. The, the one about the, the one that I saw that I remember was, uh, do you realize that the totality shadow path is going to pass through 12 different cities named something from the Bible, which is bad and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. The United States has a lot of little towns that are named after something from the Bible in it. A lot. Uh, if, if that's your big argument, it's like, that's that's not a strong one. Um, Enzo, so, do you consider, I guess it's for Enzo, it could be for me too, do you consider spirits, cryptids, and UFOs to be paranormal by definition? Yeah, I do. Because I, anything paranormal is something that you can't quite explain and... Yes, the no, traditional paranormal definition does include cryptid spirits and uh, ghosts and and you know UFO alien stuff. It's it all falls under that umbrella. Mm. Somehow in the local vernacular, the last few year, year, few years, uh, paranormal has somehow just meant ghosts. Uh, but that's not how the word is supposed to be used. It's uh, no, it's, it's anything that yeah, to to my belief in paranormal. Is not that it's just a ghost or a spirit. It's it's UFOs. It's cryptids. It's Bigfoot. It's unexplained. Like even it, it reminded me. I watched the old Ghost Hunter, uh, Ghostbusters, the other day, the original one, and I forgot all about um, um, ESP that used to be talked about heaps back in the day. You don't barely hear anyone talk about ESP anymore and stuff like that. Yes. But it was all those cards things. with the pictures on them. Oh, that was funny, yeah. And then he was getting it right, but he just kept bugging him anyway. <laughs> you can keep your money or you can keep your $5, he says, as he storms out. He was getting... oh, I love that, man. I do love it. What are you trying to prove here anyway? I'm studying the effect of negative reinforcement on ESP ability. The effect? I'll tell you what the effect is. It's pissing me off. Well, then maybe my theory is correct. You can keep the five bucks. <laughs> I um, yeah. All right. Well, well. Is that the that's you've had a lot of science stuff for us today? Is that is that the end of the Enzo show <laughs> for this week? Uh, I have more, but I just I was like, man, I talked for nearly an hour. I don't want to. Oh, well, then keep, well, keep, we'll keep that for next week's episode of Enzo the Science Guy. Did everybody see the Enzo the Science Guy intro? If you didn't, just give me a thumbs up or something, and I'll just because I'll I'll end the Enzo the Science Guy show with his jingle again i'm very proud of the jingle <laughs> and then we'll get to your then we'll get to your question brian but yeah i'm not sure i'll stuff it i'll just play it anyway because i like it where are we so that's the end of enzo's little segment for the day on science and this is enzo's jingle who's that man in the fancy shirt who's the man with the cheeky smirk who has the answers? Who can explain? Well, it's Enzo the Science.